All right, welcome back to Zero Today. And I am glad to have with me as a guest, the most distinguished Reverend Dr. C.J. Rhodes. Um, brother beloved, scholar, advocate, and anything else I missed, he is. Father, pastor, husband, and he can fill in the blanks on the rest of this stuff. CJ, thank you for uh, coming on the show. Um, so please tell my listeners a little bit more about who you are. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Neil, for uh, inviting me to be a part of the show. What a great show it is. And uh, very thankful for the conversation and the opportunity to have this dialogue. Uh, as you noted, um, I wear a number of hats. I'm the pastor of Mount Helm Baptist Church in Jackson. Uh, becoming the youngest pastor in 2010 of Jackson's oldest black congregation. Also serve in a variety of roles at the um, oldest um, um, land grant uh, HBCU, uh, Alcorn State University, uh, where I serve as uh, the director uh, and founder of the Hiram Rhodes Rebels Institute for Ethical Leadership. So shout out uh, to one of your fellow AME uh, elders, um, and um, also was the, the founder and I'm the president of Clergy for Prison Reform. And uh, in addition to those particular uh, roles, I am a husband and a father. And uh, so when I'm not at church or at Alcorn, I'm at home uh, doing, doing uh, that first ministry, if you will, uh, and really, really enjoy uh, looking back at the history of Black religion, Black church, and and then uh, using that insight to help us think about the ways in which we are influenced today and how we also make history uh, today as, as, as we are given uh, the charge to serve this present age. Uh, you said a mouthful right there, and I really appreciate it. You have a, I don't know if this is your current book, your most recent book, uh, deeper still. I know you've got maybe what two, three, four, five, ten others out there. So, yeah, who knows with you? You're so <laughs> prolific. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to have this conversation with you because we are in Black History Month. I celebrate it year round. Yeah. But um, I, not long ago, PBS did the, the documentary on the Black church uh, and I enjoyed it. I know you and I had a conversation regarding it um but when i when i saw you had the book I was like okay yeah this i know he's going to go deep into it and uh, i was i was fascinated by what your book talks about and the, the subject matter i know you deal primarily because you're baptist and i forgive you <laughs> <laughs> i can't talk for those of you who didn't know uh i actually came out of the baptist church i was licensed and ordained baptist before uh somebody knocked me on the head and made me go methodist <laughs> but um you you have a profound reflection on the not just the baptist movement in mississippi and a key reformer for the baptist movement but the entire spectrum of the black church regarding how it approached the idea of the holy spirit um and i wanted to talk to you about that so uh, tell us about your book and what inspired you to write it, and we'll just let the conversation flow from there. Sure. Well, the book is titled Deeper Still, Ministry Empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's a very trimmed down version of my doctoral uh, research, my doctoral dissertation. I got a doctor of ministry from Wesley Biblical Seminary in 2018 and what i did was a case study on charles price jones who was the fifth pastor of mount helm baptist church arriving uh, as pastor of mount helm in 1895 and 1895 1896 1897 jones along with other uh, baptist preachers uh the most notable of that group being charles harrison mason essentially formed the Church of God in Christ in the context of Mount Helm Baptist Church. 
And so what intrigued me was, was, was uh, actually two things. First, that just that history of the debate and dialogue within Black Baptist life of the time around pneumatology, that is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And what role, if any, does the Holy Spirit have in the uh, transformation of, of Christians, of churches, and then society? Um, Carter G. Woodson, we're talking about Black History Month, of course. So Carter G. Woodson is sort of the father, if you will, of Black History Month. And he uh, studied the black church kind of as a sociological study. One of the things he talked about was that there were like two groups of black Christians, particularly in the Baptist and Methodist uh, context, the progressives who were basically those who uh, were convinced that the church needed educated clergy, needed to reform liturgical practices so mm -hmm. basically, you folks like in, in your context, Bishop Haynes, you know, saying we need to be lettered, get rid of all that shouting and falling out, and we need to be refined and dignified and respectable. And we need to create institutions. We need to develop schools and have economic advancement. So that's the progressive uh, side of the coin. The conservative side, the, the larger side, were those among the Baptist and Methodists who said, I wouldn't have a religion I couldn't feel sometimes. And so Amen. they retain the shout, the ring shout, the dance, uh, things that were considered to be quote unquote African, um, believing that you don't need to have an education, a seminary degree to be called, that the Holy Spirit would, would call and equip you because the Bible says that the Holy Ghost would be your teacher. And in the midst of this debate between these two groups comes Charles Price Jones saying, both of you are right, both of you are wrong. We need to advance educationally economically, we need to adapt, we need to grow, but we also recognize that's not enough. That we need to retrieve and retain from our, our biblical and African ancestry uh, this deep sense of spiritual empowerment. And so what Jones offers what I call learning and burning, that we need it both, and that we need it both in the power of the Holy Spirit to do ministry. And so the reforms that he helped to bring about in the Black Baptist context in the 1890s are really still with us today. Um, and so the book, you know, later chapters talks about, uh, the book talks about the civil rights era and, and particularly Dr. King and how even though we wouldn't call King a charismatic, it, it was spiritual experiences in King's ministry that gave him the courage to continue to fight for justice. And then when we think about more modern uh, uh, movements, particularly the full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, I argue that a lot of that flows out of what happened in Jackson, Mississippi in the 1890s with, with C.P. Jones and C.H. Mason. And that there are younger pastors today who are in the midst of crises in their church, they're facing crises in the world, and they're recognizing that seminary alone ain't gonna, ain't gonna deal with it, pragmatism alone ain't gonna fix it, it's going to require something more. And the, and the offer from the book is we need to be unashamed about seeking spiritual empowerment to address social transformation. You said a mouthful there, <laughs> quite a bit. And I want to unpack uh, uh, some of that, uh, beginning with C.P. Jones. As you wrote in the book, C.P. Jones, uh, when it comes to the broader context of Black spiritual leaders, denominational founders, it kind of gets lost. And you, you talk about him, C.H. Mason, and how they actually work together. And I, I think uh, the other one, uh, you didn't mention him directly, but there was another person. Uh, J.A. Jeter, all, other big one. Right, right, thank you. And between them, those three, we find this shifting from a, a holiness, well, not shifting, but it's conflict between holiness and what well, now know as Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, how did that uh, affect not just, because I know you said, C.P. Jones said he'd never leave the Baptist church. He didn't want to, but he did. What about Mason? And what about Jeter? What, yeah, great question. So, 
Yeah, I mean, so for for Jones, he inter so so one of the convictions that many Baptists would agree to is that we are a people of the book. We're Bible believing uh, folks, and so what Jones was saying is, okay, Baptists are biblical people. The Bible says some things about healing, about spiritual gifts. In I think eighteen ninety six, he writes uh, basically a commentary on First Corinthians twelve on the spiritual gifts. Um, this lifestyle piece that he's, you know, talking about, you know, throughout uh, the gospels and the epistles, you hear this, you know, we, we're called to live holy, right? We are called saints. So he's he's searching the scripture and saying, wait a minute, this isn't, he said, I never, st I never intended to start a fad, uh, to start a denomination. He was really in so, so many words trying to help Baptists be more Baptist. And mm -hmm. Uh, so, but the work he was doing became controversial, particularly among the convention leadership. And I, this is one thing I kind of talk about in the book, but I don't tease it out as much as I probably should have. While this is, so 1895, he comes to Mount Helm. Well, what else is happening in 1895? The formation of the National Baptist Convention. Yes. Who's the first leader of the, of the NBC? Elias Camp Morris. Who mm -hmm. is Elias Camp Morris? He is, in many ways, Jones's mentor. <laughs> and pastor, right? And pastor, right? Because uh, Elias Camp Morris was a very notable Baptist in Arkansas. And that's mm -hmm. where uh, he also uh, helped to found Arkansas Baptist uh, College, where yep. Jones was educated. And Mason went there. He did not graduate from uh, Arkansas ba uh, uh, Baptist, but he attended for a brief period. That's mm -hmm. the Jones and Mason. Kind of, they met each other in Arkansas under the leadership of Elias Camp Morris. A, a professor at Arkansas Baptist, um, Fisher, I think it was Charles Fisher, was also a professor there who also became a, a pastor, who was a pastor at Mount Helm and helped to refer Jones to the church. So Jones is deeply connected with what is becoming the largest group of black Christians. Even now, you know, AME, y'all had it going on. Y'all had the most educated folk, right? Yeah. Y'all had yeah. all the educated preachers, but we had the numbers. <laughs> And yeah, I, I, and you mentioned that in the book. That I do. Particularly in Mississippi, I think uh, around 18, some, 1895, they were 200 plus thousand. Am I in the, in the right yeah, field? Well, no, at, around that time, you're talking about, about 2 million or so around the country. Okay, 2 million. And, and of course, largest group uh, in, in Mississippi. And so for a lot of those leaders at the state, at the local association, state and national convention levels, this was a distraction for them, right? Wait, you coming up with this all this time about we gotta live holy and talk spirit. They're trying not to be like again, the whole progressive part. People like Morris is saying, we gotta get away from that stuff. We gotta get away from what Morris called heathenism. So now Jones is allowing for that to kind of still be a part of the black church experience, but also bringing in things that he felt were coming out of Methodism. And there was all this tension. Now, nowadays, Baptists and AME folk kind of get along, you know, a lot more. But back then it was, yeah, you know, it was competition. We are trying to outdo the AME. So, mm -hmm. so there's that political element that's happening. There's a theological debate. And, and, and a lot of folks end, end up forcing Jones, Mason, Jeter, that whole camp out. Uh, Jones had some, some lawsuits ensue at Mount Helm over uh, the name change. He changed it from Mount Helm Baptist Missionary Baptist Church uh, to basically Church of Christ. I mean, he's trying to like, there's no biblical, um, there's no biblical uh, conviction that would lead us to name a church after a human being. And so he wants to find biblical language. And by the time he gets to the, to the Supreme Court of Mississippi, they rule that um, you know, no, you can't change the name of the church. It's deeded as a Baptist church. It has continued to be Mount Helm Baptist Church. And so about 1903, I think, he he leaves and starts starts a movement. Uh, and so all of them, all of them basically leave. So Jones, Mason, all of those groups of, of folks. And then in 1907, there's another split between Jones, Mason around tongues as evidence after him, after Jones. I mean, I'm sorry, after, yeah, well, after Jones sent Mason. Jeter and some other folks to uh, Azusa to figure out what, what Seymour was up to. 
uh, and that would lead ultimately to to the split that would divide. You know, you have basically a pre Azusa Church of God in Christ and okay. a post Azusa Church of God in Christ. Uh, Mason keeping the name, and then uh, Jones's faction um, would eventually become the Church of Christ Holiness USA. So, that, in a broader perspective of you know the black community, you mentioned the black as the Baptists were wrestling with this I, this sense of identity. You know how we're going to look, how we're going to present. Mm -hmm. We want to be educated. Is that a broad reflection of the? Uh, is that a reflection of the broader black community um, across the board, as, well, particularly in Mississippi? Do you think that? Yeah, was? certainly. I think you know. Again, I think you know. AME, for instance, is a great example of the tensions. And so you have people like Bishop Payne and others at certain intervals saying, "We, we have got to prove to ourselves that we are advanced people." So you know, after emancipation. The, 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 you know, the new leadership, you know, the reconstruction era leadership trying to figure out how do we advance the race? How do we, how do we move black people along? So is there a reconstruction when you get people like Hiram Revels, who, you know, Amy, you know, ordained elder, but also becomes the first U.S. Uh, senator uh, of, you know, black, of, of African descent from Mississippi. Well, why does he do that? Well, because it, it, in addition to being black, what? Let's be honest. He's articulate. <laughs> he's 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 refined, and mm -hmm. then he becomes the first president of Alcorn State University. And so there were a lot of folks saying, if we're going to advance, we're going to overcome white racism. We've got to dress a certain way, talk a certain way, act a certain way. We have to. This is one of the things I would say, and, and please don't be offended. Uh, there was a contingent that said we got to out white white people. We got to show them that we are as good, or you know, we are equal to them. So let's. Show them, look, we dress like you dress. We talk like you talk. We want, so we need the same access to opportunity. And so you see that a lot among AMEs. Now, among the Baptists, they're having this conversation, but not just, and I think I say this in the book, they're not just, if you will, trying to prove to white people that they are good enough, but to them, like black AME folks, mm. that we're not just the poor downtrodden camp. So there's this, I would, I would dare say, there is this insipid inferiority complex that Black Baptists in particular are overcoming even within Black community because even though AME is a small, you know, it's, it's large, but not as large as Baptists at the time, they had it going on. They were creating the schools, they were getting the banks, they, you know, AME, I mean, and to this day, we still have, you know, we still have this notion that, you know, think about, for instance, I'll give an example, and I know there's some uh, polity differences. But when you think about, um, you know, in the NBC, this may be kind of moving a little too far ahead, but in the NBC, we have American Baptist College that we have historically underfunded or not funded. And you all have at least five schools. Yeah. You know? And, and y'all, and, 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 and I've heard the presidents of these schools say, if it were not for AME continuing to support us, we wouldn't be here. Even Morris Brown now is getting, you know, it, making that hard reset, and it's large because of the funding of African Methodists. And we still struggle to figure out how to, you know, fund one school, let alone five. So it's it's interesting. It's, it's still um, it's still kind of this. Yes, we're the largest. Yeah, we may have <laughs> the better preachers, right? But it's always this this tension in Black Baptist life that's reflected in the broader public. How do we prove to white people that we're good enough? And how do we prove to other black people of higher classes uh, that we're good enough? And, and and I think those, I think that conversation still exists today when in some churches you're, you're, you are not well-dressed or, or appropriately dressed if you don't have a student tie on if you're, if you're a man, right? Where did that come from? Part of that is we, yeah. had, we had to show ourselves and others we're going to put on our what? Sunday best. When we're done sharecropping and working the fields, we're going to get washed up, put that suit on and have dignity. And, and I think that's, I think that's a big part of, of the tensions, even, even back in the 1800s. And I think that's, you know, it's a wonderful segue into, as we shift from that time period, 
moving into the early and mid 20th century. Well, uh, let's just jump ahead because I know that conflict really goes from 20, you know, from the early 20th century to mid 20th century, especially pre World War Two. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was still that kind of conflict, um, not just with Baptists but with Methodists too. Yeah, I think the whole black uh, spectrum was experiencing some type of conflict of who do we want to identify as. Uh, what do we want to reflect? How, what, what leaders are we going to send to represent us? Mm. And you know, you, you got your Adam Kelly and Powell, who was Baptist, but fit well in Methodist circles. You know? Right, right. Uh, now, where does this, where does the drive for the Holy Spirit? bring into this 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 view this new perspective of black worship black faith and black community where yeah, how does it, how does it bring it into perspective so going back to jones so jones essentially is a progressive he is educated he's also mulatto so he's got a little um more acceptance from white society. Hmm. Um, he is often the pastor of the big Baptist church in the college towns. When he came to us from Selma uh, to Jackson, I mean, he was pastoring Tabernacle Baptist Church in Selma, which was a notable, you know, significant pulpit. Still is. Still, still is. Um, so, but he recognized something that even though his ministry was prosperous in some way, he and his people were still lacking something, right? And he recognized that something could not be fulfilled by the very thing that offered the, the emptiness. And so it was prophesied to him uh, that he would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, that was like 1893 or so when that happened in 1894. Um, he has what we call experience. And when he gets to, um, to Jackson in 1895, he comes to a church that is um, divided. It has had about two splits by now, by 1895. And he's looking around and a lot of the people are just, you know, just in bad shape in, in Jackson, the black community in particular. Now, now, mind you, he wasn't the only person talking about the need for like, you know, character and all that. I mean, you think about folks like Booker T. Washington was, you know, big on character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the uh, Baptist leaders in the state were talking about, you know, one of the quotes that jumped out at me and really just blew my mind uh, when I was reading uh, about Henry P. Jacobs, the first president of the state convention. He said, he said we're at a point to where our pastors are neither alcoholics nor adulterers. Wow. <laughs> and he's pressing almost every annual address saying, we've got to do a better job of vetting who our preachers are because too many of them are alcoholics and adulterers. So Jones was not saying anything really controversial in that sense. Other Baptist leaders were saying that, but he said the answer cannot just be get more education because you can be educated and still be a devil. Mm. You know, you can be economically advanced and still be evil, right? So he said it has to be something within that is that's going to transform us from within and then give us the power, the courage, the strength we need to resist evil and, and to have what he called victory in this life. He said, you know, one of the things that was said back in, in, in those days was that you can live any kind of way, but as long as you confess Jesus, you can live any kind of way. And the, the preacher would say, you know, though her body sinned, her spirit never sinned. This sort of dichotomous thing. Yeah. And, maybe, I mean, and Jones is like, no, you can't just live any kind of way. I mean, what, what gospel, I mean, it seems like we have a weak gospel if it says that you can accept it, but stay the same. And he recognized that the source of that strength to be different, to be transformed, could not just be education, intellect, economics. It had to be the Holy Spirit. 
And then you start to see in the movement, you know, the manifestations of this divine healing is, is a big part of it. Um, and he said something that really blessed me. He, he was like, you got all these folk going to these doctors. These doctors are just taking money from these people and, and, and they're not getting better. But, but we lay hands on the sick and they recover. God wants you to be whole. And he's like, in so many ways, depending on the Holy Spirit means you get out of the, the cons, you know, of, of American mm -hmm. capitalism, for instance. Um, but I, in some ways, you could almost argue he was, he was novel in reclaiming that because, again, by that time, Folks were either engaged in entertainment or education. They were not engaged in the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to reclaim that. And I think even today, when you talk to folks who are freedom fighters, et cetera, they start saying, you know, we out here on the battlefield, but it's, it's tough. It's going to require, watch this, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. So if we don't yeah. wrestle against flesh and blood, we got to have a spiritual arsenal. We can't have spiritual arsenal or spiritual armor without the Holy Spirit. And so it's trying to reclaim that 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 spirituality piece that we often so often, you know, so often miss. You, you've talked about in your own research, right? That we've got to deal with some, you know, there's something else that's going on other than just policy and politics that 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 it would heal our people. And I think we we've lost that in many ways. People like Jones call us to remember. Thank you for shouting me out too. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Uh, so let, let's. I, I lost my train of thought just that quick. That's what I get for big. Nah. Um, so as we progress, Jones, Mason, they split. Mason's version of sanctification, spirit filled life becomes more popular. Yes. Becomes the dominant uh, perspective for. The black sancti sanctification or uh, holiness movement, however you want to call it. Um, where did that fit uh, as these two factions developed? And particularly, you know, they do they still identify with Baptist ideas, ideologies, or are they completely independent of each other and of the Baptist? I know they're independent of the the conventions. But how are they functioning and how is the black community uh, broadly res responding? Is, are, is, are the lesser educated people responding to Mason or the more educated people responding to Jones and the Methodists and all of this? Uh, how, how do you see that um, forming? Yeah. so. So, so a few things. One, um, they though they're no longer Baptist denominational, they are Baptistic. Um, much of the organi organizational structure and flow, even though they use a term like general overseer, et cetera, it still has some, you know, Baptist. I mean, it, there are ways in which you know I could go to a Kojic meeting or a Katusa meeting, and I'm like, there's some there's some Baptist stuff here. That, that you know, you just kind of you know, growing up in black Baptist churches, you just you just see and you sense. And, and you know, now they've also they're also including some other things. You know, they're including kind of restorationism, more like the Church of Christ movement that says, you know, only use biblical names for churches. Don't don't you know, don't say Mount Beulah number one, right? You know, or whatever, right? Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, I think I think your question is spot on in terms of I think the more educated folk start to, you know earlier years trend toward Jones, um, and the more kind of everyday folk tend uh, trend toward Mason, and that was sort of the way it was you know when they were together. Jones, you know, one writer says Jones was the urbane intellectual. So even though he's charismatic, he believes in the gifts. I mean, he is he's not hooping, he's not hollering, he's not. He's very, in some ways he's kind of against that. He said, "No, we, you know, we need to give ourselves to spirituality, not emotionalism." John uh, Mason is a lot more head first into um, retrieving those African traditions. So, for for instance, he's the one who really, uh, in his group, really preserved and modified the ring shout or the dance. So you're going to see holy dance in Kojic. You don't really see holy dance. 
in Kachusa, though you have other kinds of expressions. So for instance, a lot of the holiness folks in Kachusa was, hey, 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 you know, they'll do that. But I mean, it won't go into tongues, right? But in, you know, in Kojic, it will, it will go into tongues. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, right now, Kojic is by some accounts, the largest or second largest black denomination. And Kachusa is struggling to maintain, you know, 10,000 members. So, I mean, it's it's a dwindling movement. Um, some of that could be, you know, two, you know, two things I've heard. One, Jones never intended to have a denomination. He actually said denominationalism is slavery. So mm. I think he did not do things that would build a denomination. I mean, he was intent, you know, he never copied, copy, uh, his, his uh, uh, music was never copyrighted. And so people are singing his songs and, you know, and the denomination ain't making money off of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I know so, a few of his uh, hymns. One, one of his most famous ones that a lot of people sing is, um, I shall make the darkness a light. Right. Right. Alicia Keys is singing it and Kachus ain't getting no money from it. <laughs> you know, and they're like, man, Jones should have been thinking about this. Um, but then, you know, Kojic, I mean, in some ways, not only is it is it blown up, and some have argued, maybe maybe Mason was a little more right on the argument. But I mean, they they've dominated music. I mean, most most of our music today is influenced by Kojic, by Kojic. You know, you could be Baptist or A and and get a Kojic. You want a Kojic organist? That's right. Because I mean, they just play the organ better, you know. <laughs> uh, and so they've just been able to develop a lot, a lot of things, a lot more. Although, you know, we could argue that all our denominations are struggling today because we're living kind of in a post-denominational age. Um, but I would say that now, interestingly, a lot of the younger Kachusa folks are gravitating toward more Kojic-like flavors. And, um, and so that's very interesting to see how I argue, I argue, I may be controversial, I argue that Mason won. In the end, Mason beat the Baptist and, and Kachusa, <laughs> if, if, if it's just about the numbers. I mean, the second largest or the largest denom black denomination says a lot when it is younger than NBC and definitely younger than AME, and yet it's had such a much popular appeal, even as black folk were moving into the Midwest and, you know, the Great Migration, you know, mm -hmm. even, even you know, I'll close with this. Even a lot of the uh, what you see with the the growing Baptist and 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 AME churches are Pentecostal in some way. Very much so. Yeah, and so I think I think we have to give it give Mason his props. And that, that makes me segue into you know shifting toward this generation because I'm running out of time. Um, historically, we've had the uh what four conventions of the baptist is that right four um let's see you had nbc lock carry nbc america i forget about lock carry i would let's say five they're five you know historic ones yeah and we have um well there are actually five historically methodists too we only use three African okay. Methodist, African Methodist, Zion, and uh, Christian Methodist. But there are two others that I, I didn't know until very recently. We're all full communion, all part of the Pan wow. Methodist body. Who are the other but two? That, don't get me. <laughs> oh. I cannot name them. And I've been on the part of that. I was on the Pan Methodist Council <laughs> representing with their representatives and i'm like oh i didn't know and they're black but they're small and they're mostly i think they're they're largely uh, in the middle eastern states you know mm. on the east coast but uh but we know of the three primary and with coach uh with uh, church christ holiness where does that fit and and i know uh your pentecostal assemblies of the world and kojika pretty much up recognized as the primary Pentecostal groups. So where does uh, Jones is, and I didn't intend for this to be a full conversation about C.P. Jones, but I'm just fascinated by it. Where does, <laughs> where does it fit within the broader body of the Black religious experience? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a part of, I mean, if, if you uh, take Cheryl Sanders' book, Saints in Exile, you would, you would, she would classify it as part of the sanctified church, um, but the holiness part, the holiness part versus the holiness Pentecostal part. So there's a holiness movement um, that's, you know, more akin to like the Church of the Nazarene, um, mm -hmm. uh, United Holy Church of America, you know, which is a, a black denomination that's mainly in the, in the East. Um, but you know, one of the things I argue in the book is that Jones's influence is even trans-denominational. Uh, I would argue that much of what we call Bapticostalism, he's the father of it. He opens the door for Baptists to reclaim a kind of continuationist charismatic understanding, Black Baptist. And so even though, you know, over the years, Kachusa became, he even tried to identify as white evangelical in terms of its location for a while. Um, after, you know, sometime after Jones, right? They started to kind of connect with like your focus on the family and all that stuff. I think now a lot of leadership is starting to reclaim the blackness <laughs> of Kachusa. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little bit more diversity of thought around, around Kachusa's relationship with Kojic and other groups. In fact, we're gonna be hosting, and, and this conversation really helped me think about, I, want, I definitely want to see if you could be a part of it, but we're gonna be doing a commemoration uh, in June, June 6th marks the 125th anniversary of when the Holiness Convention began at Mount Helm, that, that movement that would ultimately become the Church of God in Christ. And we're in talks now with Kachusa, Kojic, and Baptist folks uh, to, be, to kind of reconvene to the mother church, the mother city. Uh, and um, I've been blessed to see just how cordial these different groups are now when 30, 50 years ago, there was you know, really, really big walls separating all, all three. Wow. So, and um, as all of this is unpacking, as on, all of this is unfolding, the black community is experiencing quite a bit. You know, the growing wealth, this is post World War II, I'm, I'm a, a, a growing wealth, they're growing um, political power, academic power, we see the universities and all that flourishing. But there's still unrest within the black religious faith experience. And I'm excluding the, the Methodist contingencies of that because we we always, we've been in our own little plane. <laughs> uh, but within the this context that we've been speaking with, did the still, um, within the context and uh, framework of Jones, Mason, um, and the Baptist convention bodies, we, it, we start to see another shift happening. Yeah. And I know you know, uh, you're familiar with the latest franchise of Baptist Coastal with the full gospel Baptist church fellowship. Now, I was in the initial stages of that, I was excited because I was a part of it. I got to see it grow from, I remember when, he, when Bishop Paul Morton was kicked out <laughs> of the Louisiana Baptist Convention. Yeah. I don't think it was ever really formally announced, but he was definitely kicked out. I remember when he began to form what is now the full gospel. Uh, Baptist. So, so how is that now? how is that reflective or is it coming full circle is it just reflective of what happened between jones and all, or is it full circle i like that language i think it's full circle i mean i mean in some ways um me, uh, uh, uh morton in particular grows up kojic becomes baptist and he you know and so it's so interesting to see that you know connection uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, how interesting it was that King's final message was at Mason Temple, Church of God in Christ, yeah. and how that was kind of a full circle moment. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, full gospel is now 26, 20, you know, somewhere like that years old. And one of the things I often say is a lot of what full gospel was fighting for a quarter of a century ago is now mainstream in many Baptist churches that are not even affiliated with full gospel. So praise teams, praise dancers, praise breaks, um, the proliferation of Baptist bishops. I mean, a lot of that has changed. Uh, but interestingly enough, one of the things that I'm even 
more aware of is just how many Baptist apostles there were who preceded full gospel. So you think about people like Bishop Donald Hilliard or um, yeah. you know Bishop Claude Alexander who came out of Mount Helm, who was a Baptist. Oh, really? bishop. Yeah. I did not know that. Baptized and, and licensed at Mount Helm. Um, and so there's, and so one of the things that I'm trying to help uncover is that even within NBC, you know, you, you know, I was, I put in the book that I think about four years ago now, I was at a Baptist convention meeting and there was a, a pastor who got up and said how he speaks in tongues. You know, I, that's just something I would not have heard before. One of the last meetings we had before the pandemic, they broke into a praise break and the president tried to cool it down, but I mean, people were ready to go. And there was an African, South African pastor there saying that one of the things that Baptists got to deal with is we got to become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You know, so it's it's amazing how I think we're in a different moment now. Uh, and I'm glad you asked that question because, and I'll say this, I think one of the most uh, regretful things about National Baptist history in particular, you know, what would, have, what, would have it, what, if it had, what would it have looked like, I should say, if, they never pushed Joan. They never pushed pushed Morton out. How much stronger we would be? Uh, they had even, to push King and Taylor. Out. They had to push King and Taylor. I mean, I think we we push away some of our greatest folk. Not saying that there aren't great people still in the in the in the denomination, but what would it look like if we were truly a big tent convention that made plenty of good room for each of these movements? Um, and uh, so I think we're living now in a time that is increasingly friendly to Bapticostals. Uh, and I think that's largely because of the work full gospel, but there again, a lot of full, f folks who are not full gospel who, who will whisper still like, yeah, I speak in tongues or, you know, I have dreams and, you know, and, 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 and again, I think, I think uh, you all in AME are a great example. The most notable outside of AME, the most notable AME pastors are Methodical. Whether it's about Bishop Vesti McKenzie or, uh, you know, the Bryant family. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so many others I can name, but you know, when we think about AME in terms of big platforms and whatnot, you're talking about either Methodcostal or Methodcostal friendly folks. I just think it speaks to the fact that there should be enough room um, for, for peaceful coexistence for those who may differ around pneumatology. Yeah, man, that's, that's, a, that's a lot right there. I, uh, I want to get this, Last little thing, and then we gotta, we really gotta end. Um, as the black church is shifting, how do you think that shift is translating or being articulated within a broader black community, especially in this day and age of Black Lives Matter, all the other uh, justice concerns that we're having? What, what, what role does the church play? Can play? And how can the Holy Spirit, not can, uh, where are we missing the flow of the Holy Spirit in that process and application? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you think about Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, etc. Speaks to the pneumatology even of a holistic ministry approach that the Holy Spirit is anointing the church not just a shout, but to challenge status, status quo. Um, and I think where we are today is that there's a reclamation of a more kind of holistic approach to the black church. We want to think, we want to shout, we want to pray, we want to march, we want to advocate. And why can't we do all of that in one space as opposed to, okay, we're going to go to the you know, first African Methodist church down the street, they're the justice people. We're going to go over to this Baptist church. They're going to shout me. I'm going to go over here to this, uh, you know, this church of God in Christ. They're going to, they're going to lay hands on me, cast devils. I think people are looking for, like, why can't all of the, you know, people are moving kind of beyond denominationalism and saying, if it's in the book, I want all of it. And mm. I think the church is going to have to make that adjustment. You know, we can't deny that, the, that that there's a social justice aspect to the ministry. We cannot deny that there's a mental health and spiritual health component. We cannot deny that some people are hungry for deeper, you know, especially you talk about Black Lives Matter. So one of the things I'm interested in is, is this sort of big move toward uh, spiritual practices. 
you know, uh, tarot cards and crystals and sage. Mm. There's people are crying out for some kind of spirituality that they're not really getting in a lot of our churches. And so what would it look like if we were able to honor all of that? I think a truly Jesus-centered, spirit-empowered ministry makes makes plenty of good room for all of that. Man, I agree. I concur. I, I Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um, run out of time. Tell people how they could connect with you, how they could uh, get any of your uh, products and, and um, follow up with it, any questions they may have with you. Yeah, you can find me on social media at CJ Rhodes, uh, D Men, D M I N on Facebook, at Rev Rhodes on Twitter, at Rev Rhodes82 on Instagram. Uh, you can hit me up on any of those pages to, to request uh, the book. Uh, personally, or you can go to amazon.com. It's available in print and Kindle for, uh, formats. Um, and we'd love for folks to get the book and uh, to, to, you know, if you got questions or challenges or confirmations, we'd, you know, love to, love to engage that. And thank you so much for allowing me to discuss the book and just the broader kind of space we're in uh, today. And uh, very excited about hopefully what this conversation will do to further uh, even more conversation. You and I both. Thank you so much. And listen, those of you watching, please make sure that you like and subscribe to my channel um, and support it. This, I'm listening to support it and appreciate you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for thinking about robbery to be a guest. And hopefully we can continue this dialogue. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you.